according to the Lord's word, verse 15, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, verse 17, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now we're going to go through these parallels so you can see that this whole thing is an exact duplicate of the Jewish wedding. First, the groom leaves the father's house. Jesus leaves the throne and comes to earth. That's an exact thing right there. Perfect batch. He's paralleling the Hebrew wedding. Then a marriage covenant is offered. Jesus offers us an invitation to salvation. Okay, that's our covenant. Then bread and wine are uh, eaten and drank to seal the covenant in a, in a Hebrew wedding. And at the Last Supper, the disciples ate the bread and drank the wine to seal the covenant, to accept the covenant. Then the groom pays the price for his bride. In Jesus' case, that was the blood on the cross. Okay, then the groom departs for his father's house to build a wedding chamber. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house. There are many mansions. If it was not so, I would tell you. We must remain sanctified and faithful to Jesus while he is building our wedding chamber. Then, as we know, the Father is the only one that knows when the groom can go and pick up his bride. If the neighbor asks you, hey, when's the big day? He's going to reply, only my Father knows that. For the Father is the only one that can approve the construction of the wedding chamber addition to his own home. This usually takes about a year and is usually done in a manner so that the father knows the groom is finally ready for marriage. Then the groom goes to retrieve his bride. And Jesus will come like a thief in the night to the unexpected. In the Hebrew wedding, torchlight procession to the bride's home with chauffeurs blowing. And Jesus duplicate Again, he's paralleling the Hebrew wedding. So the torchlight procession comes not all the way to the bride's home, but stops. And the groom's men will go forward to the bride's house, but not all the way to the house, because she is supposed to meet him away. So on as she leaves her house with her lamp, that lights the way, she is on the way, and then she is met with the groomsmen, where they pick her up in a carriage type thing that is carried on the shoulders of the groomsmen. And they will carry her in the air on her on their shoulders in this special chair all the way back to the groom. Notice
the groom doesn't go all the way to the bride's house, and the bride meets the groom in the air. That's the Hebrew tradition. Then they will carry the bride all the way back to the father's house in the air, where she will spend seven days consummating the marriage with the groom in the wedding chamber. It was built for the wedding. After the seven-day consummation and all the rituals that go along with that, there will be a seven-day uh, feast. The groom will bring his bride out to see the world and to show the world who his bride is, for she's been veiled for over a year. And then the wedding party begins. The guests are invited guests to the party. Now, the wedding supper of the Lamb on earth is with the Old Testament saints and the elect that have made it through the tribulation. As Jesus told them, pray that you are found worthy to be invited to the wedding supper. Notice he says wedding supper, the wedding feast, not the wedding. We know the wedding takes place in heaven before the feast because of the scripture. It's 21 verses 9 and 10 tells us. And it starts off like this. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Wife means the marriage is already completed. So what he is going to see is the Lamb's wife after the wedding. Verse 10. And he carried me away in spirit to a great and high mountain and shewed me that the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Okay. The lamb's wife, because the wedding's over, is New Jerusalem and in New Jerusalem, and it's descending down from heaven. That's the raptured people descending down from heaven. I want to talk about four different evidences that we can look at in the scriptures to suggest or to prove that Jesus indeed is going to rapture the church before the seven-year tribulation period. Let's get into it. The first is the most basic, and I've covered this in another video that I did on the rapture, but it's the scriptural reference. So if we just look at the scriptures, there's at least four or five scriptures that we want to look at. The first one is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, which says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So once again, we see here that the scriptures seem to suggest that Jesus is going to rescue us or rapture us from this wrath that is to come rather than keeping us or preserving us while he's pouring out his wrath on those who are present on the earth. Another one would be Romans 5 and 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Once again, if the tribulation period is all about God pouring out his wrath on the earth, then how could we be saved from it if we are still in it? All right, and then let's look at a third one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, once again says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That goes without saying, right? We're not appointed or destined to experience the wrath of God for no apparent reason. Now here's another one that's relatively difficult to understand. It's in 2 Thessalonians 
chapter two, verses seven and eight. It says, he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed. Now, I don't have time to unpack this entire passage, but if you look at this passage, it's talking about the coming of the Antichrist. And basically, one of the things that's going to happen before the Antichrist comes is that there's going to be a restraining force that is going to be removed from the earth. As this scripture says, this idea of a restraining force is something that is present now on the earth that is keeping the entire power of evil from going forward on the earth. It's restraining the force of evil, right? So there are several different interpretations on what this restrainer is, but the one that makes the most sense is the church, the body of Christ, because we are the restraining force that is hindering a full blunt, or if you will, of, of evil to penetrate and permeate our world. If the church is removed from this world, then there is no restraining of evil left and evil can run rampant. Well, rapture, uh, some people say that rapture is not a biblical word, but it is. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians, where the, the Apostle Paul is explaining to the Thessalonians what happens to people when they die, when believers die. And he, he said there, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, about those who have fallen asleep. He's talking about those who died, that you grieve as those who have no hope. And he talks about the fact that when Jesus returns, those who are dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain, in other words, there will be a generation of people who never die. I, and I believe we are in that generation, that many of us will never see death. That those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air. The rapture is a private event that happens between Jesus and his church before the tribulation, before wrath hits the earth, in the air, okay? The second coming is an extremely public event that is recorded in Revelation 19 that takes place on the Mount of Olives and in Jerusalem and at the end of the tribulation and every eye will see him. Now, caught up is the, uh, the Greek word uh, harpazo and it means to seize hastily. It means you run into a room, grab somebody and walk, walk out. It means to, to snatch away. But in the Latin, it's the word rapturo. And that's where we get our word rapture. And so some people say, well, rapture is not a biblical word. Well, it is if you're carrying the Latin Bible. And so it's a biblical word. It's just of a, of a different language. And so rapture is an extremely biblical concept. And 1 Thessalonians 4 is the most graphic description of the rapture, but also Luke 17, Revelation 4. There are other places where the rapture is, is described there. So very biblical uh, term. And it is, in my opinion, the next major event that will happen. 